So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Titus this morning. And Samantha. Samantha is awesome. She's, like I said, she's one of our student leaders. Um, she got to go to Passion with us last week. We had an awesome time. Her and her mom are like all in for Kingdom students. They're totally invested in this thing. So um, she's going to kick us off. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, for his zealous for good works. Awesome. Thank you, Samantha. Oh, was that not on? Oh, that's all right. Well, we'll get back to it later. Thank you, Samantha. We'll read it plenty of times. I can't hear anything up here. Thank you, Samantha. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we will we'll jump in this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you... Um, that you love us. God, thank you that you love us because of who you are and not because of who we are in Christ. Um, so Lord, thank you that you are a God who gave himself for us to redeem us like we just read. Um, Lord, I, I, I want to lift up the people in this room who come in here feeling hopeless, who, who haven't experienced the joy that comes from being adopted into your family. Um, and Lord, we would ask that, that that would be experienced this morning. And for those of us who have been adopted into your family, God, would you just remind us of how good of a father you are and, and give us the spirit to, to run after you hard. Um, ask that you be with us this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So how many of you, um, by a show of hands, if I asked you right now, could immediately tell me who your favorite high school teacher was? Favorite high school teacher. How many of you, least favorite high school, middle school teacher, how many of you, they were your least favorite because you were a punk and it was your fault and not theirs? There you go. <laughs> um, so here, here's one of the things that I love about student ministry is it seems like the, the teenage years um, are super, you're, you're super impressionable. They're super kind of formative times. Um, and, and so when it comes to student ministry, like we get to preach the gospel into a, a time of life that can can kind of put a drastic impact on, on where you go, if that makes sense. Um, everybody seems to remember kind of the details of, of their teenage years, whether good or bad. And so to get to, to get to be a voice and to preach Jesus into that and maybe set somebody on a course following Jesus for the rest of their lives is like a, a really exciting ministry to be a part of. And so, uh, so you guys know, I, I wanted to share a little bit of my experience with student ministry um, I grew up in Merritt Island, Florida, Cocoa Beach, just a couple hours north of here. Um, and I, I, we were always in church growing up, church family, like there on Sundays. And when I was in seventh grade, one of my buddies from school invited me to go to um, the student ministry at our church, and I hadn't been. And so I asked him what it was like, and he was like, yeah, it's fun. We, we do like songs, and there's a message, and then we play basketball and eat pizza. And I was like, ah, yes, I'll go to that. <laughs> And so I started going, and, and I, I enjoyed it, and I kept going back and um, started to make some friends. And, and as I sat under, like, the teaching of my youth pastor, I began to sort of, like, understand the gospel, and God began to, to do a work inside of me. And there was something I could tell, like, about this guy, that he had something that I didn't have, um, and, I, and I wanted I wanted the gospel for the first time because God was beginning to work in my heart. And um, man, I, I put my faith in Christ in seventh grade, um, and I, I started meeting with my youth pastor, and um, he, he baptized me that year. And God kind of quickly started putting in, in my heart, like, I, I want I, I want to do what he does. Like, I, this, the, this guy has had such an God has worked so much through this person in my life, like, I can't imagine doing anything but like doing that for other people in whatever capacity. And so God started to call me to ministry pretty early. Um, 
and, and we did, like, man, we had an awesome time. Like, I, I loved it. We, we did crazy fun stuff. We did discipleship things. One of, one of my favorites that I will never forget is we did these things called um, Friday Fridays on, on summer, and during the summertime. And we went out to the field one time, and we had a filth fest. And it was disgusting, and it was amazing. And when you're in seventh grade, like a filth fest, like we had a thousand people there. That's what people want to do. So we go out to the field, we go out to the filth fest, and we have like all this stuff set up. We have a giant food fight on the field. We're throwing spaghetti. Like they have us running through tires that have like sardines in them. Like it's just gross and amazing. Um, and and at, like the, the crown jewel of that event was an ultimate frisbee game. Only when we split up teams to play ultimate frisbee, and, and they go in the cooler and they pull out, I kid you not, this could not have been legal, a dead octopus. <laughs> they pull out a dead octopus and this was the filth fest frisbee. And so we split up on teams and we threw a dead octopus. And for those of you that have seen a dead octopus flying through the air, it's majestic, you know, but maybe if you haven't, like this thing was flying, like the tentacles would just like, they would spread out and it was huge. It was like this big around and it was like, oh my goodness. And then like on the receiving end, it was not as majestic. <laughs> I, like, I caught it a couple times and then I learned like, don't catch it, that's a bad idea. But I caught it and it, like the tentacles just like all around you. And it was amazing, it was amazing. Um, so we, we did like, we did the crazy, we did the fun well and we enjoyed it. Um, but man, my, my youth pastor discipled me. Like he, uh, he, he took me and a couple guys out to breakfast before school sometimes and would, he'd buy us breakfast and we'd go through the word and we'd, it was kind of like a DNA. Um, and, and like that, that, that played a huge part in my, in my faith and my development. And so um, the reason why student ministry changed my life was not because of the flying octopus. Like that was fun. But the reason why student ministry changed my life was because I was discipled. And so that was kind of, that was my experience growing up in student ministry. And most of the time, like if I say student ministry, you either haven't been in that world and so you don't really know what that looks like, or you just automatically think of kind of what, what you may be experienced with student ministry. And so as I was getting ready for this message, I came across this article and it's for, it was on the Gospel Coalition website. And it, it was written by a teenage girl who just completed, like had just gone through student ministry. So she's like fresh out, still a teenager. And it's called Four Things That Teens Need From Your Church. Four Things That Teens Need From Your Church. And she starts with this quote. Statistics claim that 70% of teens will stop attending church after graduating from high school. That's a big number. 70% of teens will stop attending church after graduating from high school. And, and there's, there's a sense in which like, student ministry had its like, heyday, and everybody had these huge, crazy student ministries with hundreds and hundreds of kids. And, and the idea is that we're very much going away from that now because people are leaving the church, students are leaving the church after high school. And so this, this, this girl that wrote this article, she knows that, and she's fresh out of student ministry, and she kind of says, hey, here's what I think we need to remedy that. Number one, she says, we need to hear the Bible, and don't give us an, an a, a abbreviated version of it. Challenge us to read it for ourselves and to model a lifestyle that is centered on God's word. Number two, we need to hear about sin. The church needs to clearly tell teenagers about sin, not in a bombastic way, but in a loving, firm, and biblical manner. Number three, we need to hear biblical truth on cultural topics. Cultural topics that are, that are being like force-fed to us by society 24-7 that they're not shy about. She says, we need the church to speak into those with boldness and with love and with truth. But, it, but it, it's the sense of if we ignore them, not everyone will. And so either truth is going to be preached or we will absorb what, what the world tells us. And then number four, 
We need to hear about radical transformation and obedience. This is from a teenager. She says, we, we need a gospel and a theology that will outlast shifting sands and temporary feelings. We need to build our house on the rock of Jesus Christ. And that, that, gets, me, that gets me pumped up. Like that, that is awesome. That is awesome because I think a lot of times we, we really celebrate and emphasize like the filth fest and, and we maybe aren't as, quite as good at discipleship and what that leads to is a big party and then people say, hey, well, I can have fun other places too. I don't need to go to church. And so what she's basically saying is this, give me, give us the real stuff. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't try to edit it. Don't try to boil it down for me. Like I want more than pizza and dodgeball, like those are great, give me those too, but give me the real stuff. See, our goal in ministry is not, our goal is not entertainment. It, it's not even to have a, a group of friends. We, we will do fun stuff. We will have friendships in the church. Jesus loves those things, and those things are great, but that is not our goal. That is not our purpose. Our goal is the real stuff. The stuff that outlasts our feelings, that outlasts what culture says at this moment, and that's the gospel. That's the gospel. And so our vision for Kingdom Students is that we would be a, a family of students who know and experience the gospel, who know and experience the gospel, to know the gospel, to be taught doctrine, like we just said, to, to preach the Bible, to inform about sin to like understand who God is, to understand who God says that I am, why I believe what I believe. We, we have to do that work of understanding and unpacking the gospel. And then secondly, like we, we don't just want to make like little Christian robots who know all the right answers. Like we, we want to, we don't want to just hear it. We want to experience the gospel. I want to experience the Holy Spirit. I want to walk with Jesus. And so that, that's the work of the Spirit. And so all I can do to that end is I can, man, I can pray constantly that that would take place. I, we can set every opportunity for, for students and for people in the church to engage with Jesus. And so that's what we want to do. And so essentially that idea of, of knowing and experience the gospel, that's essentially discipleship, right? That is discipleship. And that's our whole mission. That's not just our mission. That's the mission of the church, is to make disciples. Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20 says this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you, even to the end of the age. So, so this idea of discipleship. Discipleship is the process of becoming a committed follower of Christ. That's what, that's what God has given the mission of the church to be. That's what our mission of the student ministry is to be. That is the good stuff. That is the stuff that changes lives. That's what we are to focus on. That, that's why we've joined with, with Church United. That's, what, that's where Vision 2020 comes from. To, to evangelize South Florida, to go and make disciples. To go and make disciples. So, this morning we're going to be in the book of Titus, like Samantha introduced us to. And so, just a little bit of context on Titus. Here, here's what's going on. Um, this, this book of Titus is very similar to 2 Timothy that we just finished studying a couple weeks ago. This is a letter written by Paul to another pastor. He calls him a beloved son in the same way that he called Timothy a beloved son. And, and so this is a pastor who Paul cares for. This is a pastor who is a, a, a co-worker of, of Paul. Like he's, he knows him, he's in the trench, and he's, he's mentioned a handful of times in the New Testament, but really outside of this book, he's not like a super prevalent character um, in the New Testament writings. And so Titus was in a place called Crete. He's on the island of Crete, and Crete is well known. Like this, this island where he is is well known in the region for being pretty immoral, um, pretty crazy. It's like kind of like a, it's like if Las Vegas was a first century 
island. Like that's kind of like, that's kind of like what Crete was. It was just known for being maybe not um, the best place, maybe not the best culture there. And so as far as we know, Paul didn't spend like a ton of time doing like long ministry there, but he likely visited and, and sort of knew what was going on with the churches there. And so here we pick up with Titus, and he's, he's sent to this island to do ministry to these churches. And it says in chapter 1, he's sent there to set to order these churches because there's kind of some disarray and dysfunction in these churches on this, on this island, and he's sent there to set them in order. So he's behind enemy lines, he's kind of cleaning up this mess, and he's overwhelmed by a culture that is far from God. And I think that we can probably relate to that this morning because we are in a culture that is far from God that feels like it's going farther and farther from God. And so here we go. Um, there, there's sort of two things that, that Paul highlights in this book. He, he's super, like, he's very authoritative. And he puts a huge emphasis on two things. The first all throughout this book is the gospel. Like, he, he's not ashamed of it. It's the, at the beginning, it's a couple times in the middle, and it's at the end. And the whole book is only three chapters. So there is a lot of grace and a lot of good news of Jesus. But the second thing that he emphasizes is godly living. Godly living. And he says, look, this godly living happens as a result of knowing Jesus. Like, if you say that you are in Christ, then the result should be this godly living. And he's very clear, like I said, on that first point. He's not saying that the, these works put you in right standing with God. He's saying, look, because of Jesus, in Jesus we have redemption and we have hope. And I mentioned earlier, man, there's probably some people in here who came in here feeling hopeless, came in here feeling beat down, have never experienced the hope that comes from the God who made you. And so my encouragement to you this morning is, man, really lean in when we talk about that gospel point. And that godly living point, that's for those of us who are in Christ. Because in Christ, we've been made right with God. Jesus has done the work, and it's completed. And so since we're talking about discipleship this morning, since we're talking about discipleship and how that is the mission of the church, and Titus is, is trying to bring order to these churches so that that might happen, I think there's three themes from the text that I want to highlight that I think inform discipleship. Three things that the discipleship is. Number one, discipleship is a family process. It's a family process. It's multi-generational. And here's what I mean by that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you really quickly. Um, I'll skim through some of it. Verses 1 through 10 in chapter 2. This is right before what uh, Samantha read. And so Paul's telling Titus, listen, I, you need to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Here, here's what you need to tell this church. Older men, you are to be sober-minded and dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and steadfastness. And older women, likewise, you're to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine, but, but teaching what is good and training the younger women. And older men, it goes down in verse 6, you are to urge younger men to be self-controlled. See, there, the, there is an aspect of this letter that is very much like, hey, in the church, for those of you who are in Christ, Paul is saying, older men, older women, you have a responsibility to the younger generation in your church. That this discipleship is multi-generational. It's a whole church family thing. And just as a side note, um, when, I, when I say family process, I'm, I'm talking about the family of the church. But just so that we're on the same page, that starts in, in your family. So older men, older women, parents, grandparents, this is, a, this is a family process that starts in your home. God has tasked you to be the primary discipler of your home. Not the church, not kingdom students, not kingdom kids. You are to set the example for godly living. That's my favorite part of parent meetings. <laughs> hey, it's not my job. 
I will help, and we're here to support you, and, and we will fill in the gaps. But, but the job of discipleship in the home, God has appointed to you. And so jumping back to um, discipleship in the family context of the church. In the church, man, there are, there are spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, spiritual grandparents even, and aunts and uncles. Like we're, we're, not everybody has to be a spiritual father to, to like a person in the youth specifically. That's not what this is about. This isn't just youth and kids. This is, this is everybody. But we are called to be a part of the family. We are called to play a role in the family because Paul is saying older men and women have a responsibility to the younger generation. When, the, when there's like extreme age segregation in the church, I think that everybody misses out. Because, because young people miss out on the wisdom and, and the insight of, of like knowing and, and like being taught from somebody who's walked with Jesus for a really long time, who's lived a lot of life, who's made mistakes, who's followed Jesus. Like, like they're missing out on that. We're missing out when, when, when we're just always only by ourselves. Or, or this group of here is always only over here. You guys are missing out on Snapchat and all kinds of stuff you don't know about when you're just over here, okay? It's, it's amazing. Um, but the point is that when we are, when we are separated, I, th I think that we miss out because the church and discipleship is a whole family process. We, we say a lot, um, and I hope it sticks, that we don't want to just make like a little kingdom students church because that, that would be selling ourselves short on what the church is. We don't want to just be our own, our own um, little thing. My, my, one of my fears is that I don't want us to be able to have a student who can go through middle school and high school and never have like a, an, an important relationship with anybody who's not a peer. Because Paul is clearly saying, look, this, this family, you have a responsibility to be engaged in the diversity of the church. See, that, that diversity, it crosses age, it crosses race, it crosses class. That's what the gospel does. So what's your role in that? What's your role in that? Is it to lead your home? Are you, are you leading your home? Are you discipling those in your home? Are you engaging with diversity in the, in the context of the church? I don't know what that looks like. It doesn't have to be youth. It doesn't have to be kids. But like, are you engaging in diversity in the church because that's one of the things that the church is. And so that can happen a lot of ways. That can happen as, as people commit to pray for people and tell them that they're praying for them and text them prayers. People have started texting me prayers and it's amazing. <laughs> All I do is put the little heart on it. So like, I don't know, but like, I hope that tells them that I like it. But um, it's like, it's really encouraging. Or maybe it is coming, maybe it is being a youth volunteer or going to Kingdom Kids or, or like going to that DNA that's full of people that are older than you or full of people that look different than you. There's like a hesitancy there, but that's part of the beauty of the body of Christ. And youth, guys, it's not, it's not just for them. This for us. Are, are, we, are we willing to like listen to people who are older and wiser than us and to, to imitate them, people who have walked with Christ and who love Jesus and who love you? Are we willing to like set aside that notion that I know best to like actually listen to other people? To <laughs> they're like, yeah, no, you're not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but like, e even to lead by example, to set an example for the believers, that's something we talk about a lot. Like Samantha, getting up here in front of the whole church and reading the Word of God. There's a lot of people in this room who wouldn't do that. How old are you? Thirteen. 13 years old, getting up, setting an example for the believers. That's what I'm talking about. So number one, discipleship is a family process. It's multi-generational. Number two, discipleship is a training process. It's a training process. These are the verses that we read earlier. I'm going to read 11 and 12 quickly. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people. And when he says all people, that's not like a universal, everybody's saved. That it's very clear he's in the context of talking to the church here. So grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, those in Christ. And that's not the end of the sentence, but it continues, training us 
to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And so this, this, is, the same, this is the same grace, grace that saves, and we like that, and we're really good at knowing that, and we need to know that, that there's nothing you can do to inherit salvation. There's nothing you can do to be made right with God. That is a gift that God freely gives us. There's nothing we can do. But that's not the end of the sentence. He goes on, he says, that same grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly living and to live towards self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Same, same grace trains us. Have you ever been trained in something? Have you ever been like, like pushed or, or worked or stretched or pushed to your limits by, by like, you ever done that? Yes. It's the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. I, we started working out. We started working out. Yeah, you know this is coming. With Brendan and Nathan, we started working out in the mornings. And I, I mean, I like it sometimes, but most of the time it's the worst. It's like crazy early and we're running and we're like lifting weights and stuff. And, and I, I used up all my good excuses on the first week and now I don't have any more. So I just have to keep going. Um, and John O'Brien was talking last week about how, like, oh, I started running this week, and then I went and ran nine miles. And I'm like, who does that? Who starts running and is now running nine miles, like, three days later? And he's like, yeah, it was hard. I'm like, yeah, it's hard. But because I, 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 literally, I ran two miles this week and almost went to the hospital. Like, I, I, want, <laughs> I wanted to go. It was so humid. It was, and these guys are, like, way out in front of me. And I'm like, just go. It's fine. Like, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. It was terrible. It was a very humbling experience. I hope no one drive, drove by. Um, and all I could think about was John running nine miles. And I'm like, I hate that guy. <laughs> but, but for real, like these dudes, they, they, they push me and we hold each other accountable. And, and we do what we really most of the time probably don't feel like doing. And yet we hold each other accountable and we do it anyways. But that's, that's, like, that's usually not the approach that we all take to discipleship. That's like an over here thing, and then discipleship, maybe we don't treat it in that same way. Because when we hear things like, like hard work or, or, or like discipline, a lot of times we, we start to get theological alarms going off in our head. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is, this is not works righteousness. This is about Jesus did the work, so I don't have to. And we get these alarms, and those are good alarms. Those are good. That means that we, like, understand the gospel. But hear what I'm saying. These are two different things. See, no amount of work, no amount of work or good deeds can ever put you in right standing with God apart from Jesus. No amount of discipline, no amount uh, of, like, really pursuing God. Like, apart from Jesus, we are hopeless. Apart from Jesus, we're hopeless. When it comes to salvation and being made right with God, works don't work. We're, we're sinful and God is so good that, that sin can't be in the presence of God. And so he had to send his son to take on our sin and to pay for it so that we could be in his presence. That's the good news of the gospel. And nothing we do can earn that. That is a gift that we inherit that perfect standing with God. No amount of good work does that. So what are we, what are we talking about? Like to be trained, to, 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 like, to be disciplined. And that's when we gotta remember, like Paul, Paul surrounds these passages of like, hey, don't do this and do this. Paul surrounds those with the grace of the gospel. This happens in light of what Jesus has done. This is a result of first being made right with God through Christ. First, having that salvation, being adopted into his family. The fact that God's favor was freely given to you when you didn't give a rip about God and you wanted nothing to do with him. Grace, grace invades your heart and causes you to come to God. That's a gift. And then he says, when you receive that gift, the result, that same grace, that same grace that gives me salvation gets to work inside of me. It gets to work putting sin to death. It, it gets to work following Jesus. That's that same power. 
That's the same power, and that's hard work. <laughs> and a lot of times we're really bad at it. But that's God honoring work. And a lot of time that work, that work is opposed by the enemy. He doesn't want you doing that work. Because we, we, want, we like what's easy. We like instant gratification. We would rather just kind of, just like, we like those top two lines. Like, grace has given us salvation so we can, we can live however we want to live. Paul does not say we live however we want to live. He says when you've received that grace, that Holy Spirit begins to, to work inside of you. Because discipleship, like we talk about discipleship, discipleship is slow. It's not, it's not a lightning bolt event. It, it happens over time. It happens as you walk with people who are different than you. You train them. Jesus walked with his disciples for years. And there were times that he, there were those like, man, you still don't get it moments. There were ups and there were downs, but he walked with them. And we are called to take up our cross and to renounce sin. Paul says to, to put away, to renounce ungodliness and to live towards godly living. And a lot of times we don't feel like that. One of the things my, my youth pastor said to me one time, and I, it was the first time I ever heard it, and I thought it was amazing. He goes, man, sometimes like, I just don't feel like reading the Bible, but I do it anyways. And I was like, what? That happens to you too? Like I thought, I thought it was just me. I thought I was a terrible person. You're like, you work at a church and you don't, wanna, you don't feel like reading the Bible sometimes? Like that was so freeing. But he's like, man, sometimes like even if that's not what I feel, like I, I know the truth of who God is and what God has for me. So I'm going to pursue him anyways. And so that, that training, please hear me, that training is not in order to get to God or in order so that God likes you. That training is because God has gotten to you and you can't help but do anything else than pursue that God. Number three, discipleship is a Jesus-focused process. Gospel-centered discipleship always brings us back to Jesus. I have to tell you, I had grand visions for this last point and it was gonna be so much different. And I wanted to call it a boomerang process. And I was gonna bring a boomerang because a boomerang always comes back. And I was gonna throw it and it was gonna be amazing and you guys were gonna get it. Everybody was gonna get saved. Um, I could see it in my head. And then I went and I bought a boomerang and I threw it and it went 15 feet up in the tree and it didn't come back. And I was like, okay, I guess, I guess we're not doing that. Um, that's a terrible idea. And also somebody would've, you know, bad idea. Would've hit somebody in the face. Um, and it didn't even work because it didn't come back. Anyways, regardless, this is a Jesus, we're going to call it a Jesus-focused process because in discipleship, in pursuing Christ, like, we're going to fail. But it always brings us back to the gospel. It always comes back to Christ. See, we are, we are first made new by Christ in the gospel. And then that, that newness, like, encourages us to be trained towards righteous living. And our imperfect execution of that task takes us right back to the top and right back to the fact that Jesus did the work for us. We are not approved of based on your success or failure to do that. So the last, the last uh, verse that I want to read uh, for this last point is um, Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Listen to what he says. He, sa he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the reason why I want to end with that is because that's how Paul ends. That's how Paul, that's like, that comes after. Paul says, live this way. Put these things to death. Live towards this. Do the work of discipleship. And remember, and remember, man, it's not because of our righteousness that he saved us. It's the renewal. It's the, it's the pouring out, the rich pouring out of the Holy Spirit into our hearts who don't deserve it. Brings us right back 
to Christ. So in just a second, um, we're going to have some prayer partners come up. Um, we're going to go into a time of, of prayer and worship, and if you need prayer, you can come up. But I, I just quickly want to sort of review. As the church, we have been called to make disciples. That's our goal in Kingdom Students. That's our goal in the Avenue Church. That's, that's Church United's goal, to make disciples. But here's the reality. We can, we can be really good church people and never be discipled. You can have a great attendance record. You can be a regular face on Sunday morning and miss out on deep discipleship, which is our goal, which is our calling. So discipleship is, number one, a family process. In the home, first, and in the church. Are you discipling your home? Again, if that's a position that God has put you in, he's very clear that he's put you there on purpose. Are you engaging with diversity in the church? In whatever way that looks for you. Maybe that's committing, like I said, to prayer. Maybe that's going to that DNA. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe that's helping with kingdom kids. Maybe that's helping. I don't know. But are you, are you pursuing connecting with the whole body of Christ? Because that's an essential element of discipleship. Number two, discipleship is a training process to renounce worldliness and live towards godliness by the Holy Spirit. It's a training process. Are you being trained? Have you given people in the church permission to train you, to call you out, to hold you accountable in your best interest so that you might know and experience more of the gospel? Have you put yourself in that context and given people the permission to do that? Because it's that same spirit, that same spirit of salvation that as it works inside of us, encourages us to pursue godliness. And then number three, Discipleship is a Jesus-focused process. Always leads us right back to the gospel, to the fact that, that Christ in his goodness pursued us when we wanted nothing to do with him and we deserved nothing to do with him. And he chose to redeem us. He chooses to redeem us and then he chooses to begin that work inside of us and make us new. That's the good news of the gospel. Okay, so I want to close with this reminder. I, again, I just want to read those last two verses. Because to those of us in Christ, that's the truth this morning um, that it all comes back to. And that's Titus chapter 3, verse 5 again. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, like I said, we'll have, we'll have prayer partners um, and Mitch will come up and close us out with some announcements. Jesus, thank you that it's all about you. God, thank you that you do the work in salvation in pouring out your spirit on us. And then even in training, God, that's your spirit at work inside of us that causes us to seek those things. So thank you that you're a God who chooses to pursue people who do not want to pursue you most of the time. God, thank you for your church and the way that you have established it, the diversity in your church. Lord, I just ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would allow us to not just know, but to experience deep, deep discipleship. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.